I am Brad Keeler. She is Liz Smith. Find out next on Director's Cut why she had to bring chainsaws to drilling sites. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I am the director of the Geo Institute. That is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every week, I sit down with a different GI member who will tell you all kinds of fun things about themselves and about their lives. Some of them are personal, some are professional, but again, everything is fun. If you like what you are about to see, and I think you will, click the little button that says subscribe, click get notifications, and you will know every single time we post a new video to our channel. This week, we are very fortunate to be joined by Liz Smith from Terracon. Liz is also the 2020-2021 Geo Institute Cross USA lecturer, which means she travels this great land of ours as soon as we can all travel again to talk about topics that she agrees on with the chapters. You can find out more about it at geoinstitute.org. We will talk a bit more about it in a moment. But for now, welcome, Liz. Thanks for being with us this week. Thanks for having me. We will dive into the interview the same way we do it with everyone else. The first question is always to describe your job in 45 seconds. Okay. Well, I'm a senior principal and a vice president at Terracon. I'm a geotechnical engineer and a Virginia Tech grad. Very proud of that, of course. <laughs> um, as are all Hokies, I'm sure. <laughs> My job is really um, to solve story problems. Uh, the problem is we have to define what the story and the problem are at the beginning. So I typically work on big highway projects designing foundations and retaining walls. But very often I'm called into projects that have something not exactly going well. And so I come in and help solve whatever those problems might be and help get the project back on track. I think we have to have a bonus question here because as you can see from Liz's background, she is a little bit of a proud hokey, as the sign says. How old were you when you figured out what a hokey was? A freshman. And can I mean, you can you tell the viewers what is a hokey for those who are uneducated? Okay, a hokey, contrary to what a lot of people from Virginia would tell you. <laughs> a hokey is simply a nickname that came from a cheer. And the cheer is, and it's very old, hokey, 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 high, tech, tech, VPI, solar X, solar raw, polytech, Virginia, ray raw, VPI, team, team, team. That is fantastic. So it has nothing to do with turkeys. No. Someone in someone in my high school insisted that it was I, a very specific type of turkey. No. No, they're all lies. It's wow. just from this cheer that was from like 1890 or something. So I can't even remember this kid's last name, but Matt, I hope <laughs> you're watching this. <laughs> and that you've seen the, you, the web of lies that you've woven about the Virginia <laughs> Tech mascot. That's right. And usually they're the Cavaliers who are spreading those nasty rumors. <laughs> So we ask a lot of fun questions on Director's Cut. We're going to hit one of those right now. What is your least favorite breakfast food of all of them? The little sausage patties that you slice. You know, I, I'm a foodie. I pretty much like everything. I like any other kind of sausage. But and I think it's because it gives me indigestion. But I love bacon. <laughs> a, an equally salty probably much better tasting alternative. Yes, when it's crispy. <laughs> Which is an important distinction I have learned in my house. Apparently I make something that's a little more country that is like 
soggier and chewier, and that doesn't cut the mustard a lot of the time. Yeah, I don't like that kind of bacon either. (laughs) So we also ask a lot of questions on Director's Cut, where we ask you to think back. And I read another interview that you did, I believe it was with Pile Buck magazine, where I saw that you first thought about becoming an engineer in ninth grade. That is interesting to me. I would like to know, what did you want to do before that moment? And is it something that you are still interested in to this day? Like I can remember that far back. <laughs> I I think when I was in ninth grade, um, I took shop. So I had taken home ec and I had taken art, which I was not good at. And then I took shop and I was the only girl in my shop class and my best friend's mom was really mad she called my mom and said how dare you let her take shop and my mom's like excuse me (laughs) she said well now kim wants to take shop and my mom said you know what i have to do a lot of stuff around the house when my husband's at work and i think it's a good idea so we had metal shop and wood shop and my metal shop teacher said Uh, What we were having to do lettering back in the days, you know, when you had to actually hand write plans, those olden days (laughs) and um, learn lettering. And uh, we had to draw isometric drawings and things like that. And I could draw things that were like rectangles very well. And so my teacher, his name was Mr. Lewis. He said, you need to be an engineer. And it was the first time that anybody had said engineering to me. My parents, uh, my mom was German from Germany and my dad was Italian from Sicily. And I had never even heard of engineering. It's funny, though, because several of my friends growing up, their dads were engineers and I got along really well with their dads. And I didn't have any idea why until I grew up and became an engineer. And we still get along really well. (laughs) Same brains. (laughs) I guess. uh, Engineers. But I I thought maybe I would be, I don't know, an astronaut or a lawyer or I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. (laughs) It's interesting to me that you said you weren't either you weren't talented or you didn't enjoy art because I think back to a lot of things that we did. We had to design floor plans. We had to do a lot of design work period in art class in junior high and in high school. And I would think that the, that engineering and art would run right together, but often they do not. Well, okay. So if it was something that I had to build, that was cool. I like that. I remember in, Art in seventh grade, I made a giant mushroom <laughs> out of it was a plaster of Paris. You know, you had cart. I don't remember with newspapers, and so I made a mushroom, and it had like fuzzy stuff. I used newspapers, and then I painted it these crazy colors. This was in the seventies. That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know anything about magic mushrooms at the time. <laughs> It was just, you know, a seventh grade kid, you know, making a colorful green mushroom with red spots on it or something. But, yeah. That is great. So a quick perusal of your CV or your resume will show that in the late 80s, you worked in Maine for a couple of years for Haley and Aldrich. Yep. What was unique about working in Maine? What was challenging, I guess, but what mostly what was unique about it for you? So when we had projects that were not in the city, which was usually because most of Maine is rural and most of Maine is wooded. And I remember having to hot call and schedule a drill rig and they would say, okay, uh, what kind of rig you need? It's like, uh, we needed the uh, all-terrain. Okay, you need a bombardier. We called them bombs. Yep. You need chainsaws? Yep. And then <laughs> we would go, we'd show up to the drill site, 
And then they would just take the chainsaws and clear out the area where we needed to go so they could access the drilling location if there was anything in the way. It's not like they were cutting down giant trees or anything. They were usually just little saplings so we could get access. But I can't imagine nowadays anybody saying, you need us to bring some chainsaws? <laughs> <laughs> that is good, though. That's a super unique experience, I think, especially for anybody who lives south of about 47 degrees north, I would think. <laughs> So another one where you have to think back, maybe not as far as that one, but maybe a lot farther, was can you think of a time professionally where you felt like you were in over your head and how did you deal with it? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and there have been a couple of different situations I've been in. Typically, in over my head is not a technical problem mm -hmm. because if I felt uncomfortable with something I was doing, there were always other people I could ask for help. And I always did. In fact, when I was working in Maine, I was, I was working on this project that was huge and I was just a year and a half out of grad school. And I was, I was meeting with engineers from TY Lynn and, I kept thinking, you know, shouldn't somebody be with me? <laughs> <laughs> I was in a position, I was in a situation where I, I was doing a lot of stuff that I thought somebody else needed to really be paying attention. And my the project manager was also the office manager. And so he was busy doing other things. And he's like, you're doing great. You're doing great. And then one day, um, one of the real senior guys, I think he was on the board. His name was Ed Kinner. Uh, called me and said, hey, I'm really interested in this project. Or maybe he came to the office to visit. I can't remember. But I know he said, hey, I, I was really interested in this project. I worked on the original I-95. 95? Yeah, I think so. Um, going up through that part of South Portland. And they had some really interesting engineering problems. So if you have any questions, just call me. And, of course, I was terrified to call him because I was – you know, fresh out of grad school, and he's like on the board. But one day I called him and I said, I really need help. And I'm kind of afraid of, I, I think I know what I'm doing, but I want somebody like you to review my work. And I'll tell you what, he was in the office because he was in Cambridge and we were in Portland. He was in the office the next day. And I felt really bad, like I snitched on my boss. <laughs> But I think this is a great lesson, I think, for younger people that you don't always have to know everything, but you have to know enough to ask when you get in that type of situation. And that's right. as long yeah. as you have the right people around you, you're going to be just fine. Well, the other thing is I shouldn't have been so worried about asking because uh, – a lot of times, and I see this in a lot of the young people I work with now, they get, they're afraid to call me. Well, I know you're busy. It's like, yeah. I'm always busy, but I'm not too busy to help you. And I really have to stress that to people that I want to be of help to you and I want you to succeed. And I can't help you succeed if you don't ask for help. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That is great. We, we try to impart some life lessons here on Director's Cut. <laughs> the, there are two questions that we ask everybody. The first one is always describe your job. The second one is how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? Oh, my gosh. I got involved in ASCE as an undergrad. Yeah, I think it was the only club I belonged to. I was a co-op student, so it took me five years to get through school. I went through the an official co-op program where I had a fit sit schedule and then I was and we were on the quarter system. So I was there for a quarter and gone for a quarter and there for maybe two quarters and then gone for two quarters. And ASCE was the only thing that I felt like I could belong to. And it really mattered to me. Um, so I started as an undergrad and then we <laughs> We had the concrete canoe races when I was a senior and we were competing at Clemson and somebody said, hey, we need another girl to paddle. 
was like, I'm a senior. I'm getting ready to graduate. I was married. I was like, oh, seriously? Okay. Well, I wasn't a very good paddler, so it wasn't a great experience. But the in- Geo Institute, um, you know, I don't even remember when we started the Geo Institute, but I remember going to one of the first meetings in 1997 in Utah, and I've tried to go to every meeting ever since. That was the very first, I guess, what would become Geo Congress, and of course yes. we've done 25. And you can remember when we started, because this year is our 25th anniversary, so we started oh. in 1996. It's uh, been a long road. Yeah, okay, so I've great. been a member since it started. <laughs> Which we appreciate. Now, it's been amazing to me how many responses to that question started with a uh, concrete canoe or a student <laughs> activity. A couple of them have involved pizza. Actually, more than a couple have involved pizza, I think. And uh-huh. the, 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 the great unifying force. <laughs> right. That is bread and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, when you're a college student, like a staple. <laughs> Lifeblood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this next one. I think will be interesting to everyone, but it's particularly interesting to me. I, uh, My wife and I have a 14-year-old and 11-year-old, and <laughs> thinking of them being out of the house sometimes seems very far away and only a few days away. All your kids are adults, and they're out of the house. What was the biggest mental change for you and your husband as parents when they started to leave? Relief. <laughs> <laughs> So our oldest stayed here until last year when he got married. And so he was 28 when he finally moved out. Um, The other two started college. So it was a more gradual leaving. You know, they started out and they come home and back and forth. And and then they just kind of quit coming home other than for holidays. And um, I... You know, if you had asked me if I could have given them away at 14 and had them back when they were 20, that would have been much better. (laughs) But it didn't work out that way. And so we struggled through the teen years and then survived. And it's funny because we're my husband and I, we're really happy now that they're gone. (laughs) We love our children and we love having them visit and then we're really happy for them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> what what milestone do you think was the hardest though? I mean for you guys personally, was it like first day of kindergarten, high school graduation, college, marriage, what emotionally what was the most taxing? Um oh jeez, teens. It, it, <laughs> You know, where they're, especially with my youngest, because he's the youngest of three boys and he's smart and knows everything. And it's like, but you're not old enough. I know, you know, but you're just you. There's stuff you can't do. And, you know, having him finally grow up was grow up was a big relief for us. He he was our. You know, it's all they always say if you had the last one first, you wouldn't have any more kids. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So for me, I traveled all the time. I traveled I've traveled my whole career and even when they were little, you know, I, I've made a point of always being home on the weekend. Yeah. But having them blossom and go and do their thing, I don't think it wasn't hard for us. We were just happy for them. I mean we worried about them and stuff, and I missed them, but, you know, we have phones now where you can see each yeah. other. <laughs> I think that's reassuring for people with younger kids <laughs> because, again, like I said, some days it feels like, oh, we've got so much time until they're gone, and then other days you're just like, oh, really, that's only a few years, and we're more than halfway. Yeah, but my husband and I get along really great now that they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> So some, fun. <laughs> something else to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. 
So we have just a few questions left to go. And another fun one here is when you go to a zoo or an aquarium or some wildlife place, what is the first animal that you make a point of seeing? Well, the first animal I usually see, even though I don't like them, is the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. So we had a membership to the San Diego Zoo when we lived in San Diego and the kids were little. And the first place you go when you go in the door is the snake house. And my kids love, I have boys. They love going to the snake house. And I was like, ah. But we always went to the snake house. And then we would finally get to the stuff that I liked, which was the pandas and the elephants and the apes. I really liked the big apes. Did you have a traumatic snake story at some point that led to your disdain of them? Or is it just a general dislike? Well, I had never really been around them. And we were camping. Oh, my gosh. We didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid. So a vacation was we went camping somewhere. And we were camping with my godparents. And their daughter's a couple years older than me, but she's really tall. So we're hiking in the trail going around the lake and we see a black snake curled up in the middle of the path. And I remember we both screamed and I jumped on her back and she ran. <laughs> that's that's enough to do it, though. One one terrible snake sighting is enough to scar you for life, well, I think. I think I was like second grade, maybe. It just scared us. It was probably very harmless, but you know, we growing up in Virginia in the in the, the tidewater area, we had you know you have to worry about water moccasins uh, and stuff, and so it's always like every snake is a cotton mouth. <laughs> but I, it's gonna kill you. <laughs> I kind of get that. I I inadvertently brought a copperhead into my parents' house when I was in college, and. <laughs> Since then, I think my outlook on snakes has changed a little bit. I was I was always kind of just like, eh, and now I'm a little more wary. You brought it in on purpose? No, no, no. Oh, it's a okay. whole. It, it came in in a plant that I had. Oh. <laughs> but well, that's was, what you get for growing pot back then. It was it was not a great it was not a great experience. It, it was a ficus tree because the pot the pot was big enough that it could burrow in there and. Right. Uh, that was a little bit of an adventure that I do not wish to have again. We had ficus trees here in our living room, really big. They were almost 20 feet tall. And one day my husband goes, um, there's a snake skin in the ficus tree. We don't know where the snake was. <laughs> and you never found it, huh? No, huh? no. That's Another the time he was vacuuming in the front room and he thought there was a stick or something and it was a snake and he just opened the front door and off it went. <laughs> so we've got we've got two questions left. Okay. One is you currently live in the Austin area. You started the Women in Transportation chapter in Austin. I don't know how many years ago it was now. What is the most lasting lesson you learned from starting that up? Okay, so this is fun. I uh, was a member of WTS when I was in San Diego, and I came here and said, where's WTS? It was a very vibrant organization in San Diego. So I decided, you know, one of my goals, I actually wrote it down because we had to have outside goals as well as inside goals. Um, one of my goals was make WTS happen in Austin. And they had a chapter, but it was like six people and it wasn't doing anything. So I talked to some of my the women because I needed I needed to meet other professional women in the area. And so I don't know how I had been working on a proposal. So I met a couple of people and then they knew some people. And, you know, so we got together and we went to lunch. And we said, let's do this. And everybody. OK, well. We went around the table. We were at P.F. Chang's in one of those big booths. And I was last. And that's why I ended up being president. <laughs> but I got a phone call from a student and said, I want to apply for your scholarship. I was like, do we have a scholarship? <laughs> and I, so I called the corporate folks and said, 
do we have a scholarship? And she said, no. And I said, well, how do we get one? And she said, well, you need to have a fundraiser. And so one of the things that we knew how to do was how to have a party. (laughs) And we had the first, we had the gala event. And we had a silent auction and a live auction. And we raised over $10,000 the first party we had. And I think now... We went from having six members to 80, no, maybe 60 members the first year. And then the second year I was president, it was closer to 100. And it's one of the, it's a fabulous chapter now. And because I've traveled so much, I haven't been able to go to a lot of the meetings, but I always go to the gala when they have it. And um, I always buy a ton of stuff because you can get great artwork at these things. And so we raise a lot of money, but that's it. If you want to raise money for something, have a party. And I think when you build something like that from the beginning, it's re- it's really meaningful. I mean, it's yeah. you're you're probably never going to lose contact with the people who are running it, even if you only go to that one thing a year. I, well, it's funny because I'll go to these meetings and they'll be signing me, and then they're like, "You are," and I'm going to go, "I'm your mother." <laughs> Because they don't necessarily know who I am because I don't come to the meetings very often because just because I'm not around. Right. But uh, the, it's funny, the core group of us, we're all still friends. And it's funny how when we get together, we it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Made some lasting friendships. And it's probably going to stick around for quite a while, I think, if you've got that many people involved in it now. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's a great chapter. Yeah. So our final question today is starts out as less of a question than a statement. You are, the, as we mentioned at the top of the show, the 2020-2021 Cross USA Lecturer for GI. There are a couple of things here. One, you're the 11th Cross USA Lecturer. Two, you are the first woman Cross USA Lecturer. And three, you are the first Cross USA Lecturer who has been a practitioner for their entire career, which I, I think all of those things are significant. So what is the most exciting thing to you about this opportunity? I'm also the first non-PhD. That's true, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really surprised <clears throat> when I was asked to to do that. I was like, well, you couldn't find anybody else. <laughs> so I wasn't really, it was like, how did they end up picking me? But um, I like to tell stories. So, and I have a whole bunch of them from things that I've learned. Cause you know, when things go really well, you might learn something, but when things go really bad, <laughs> you learn a lot. <laughs> And I've been involved in a lot of projects uh, where things have gone not very well, and I've had to help solve a lot of problems. And it's it's a lot of fun. So the the favorite presentation that I like to give is the um, lessons learned from failures. And because I've been involved in a number of retaining wall failures, slope failures, and, you know, permutations thereof, where, you know, it's not always something that you can just put your finger on, and they're very subtle things, and it's one of the things, actually, that I learned from Mike Duncan, because he was always a very practical engineer, and in his classes, he would give us examples of these kind of things, and he'd say, you know, it's not it's not the 10 foot sand layer or whatever that's going to be your problem. It's that one little mm-hmm. clay layer that's that you that you might not even see that could be the problem. And but you have to know how to differentiate between is this little layer going to be a problem or not for my application. And even sometimes when you know it's there and you know it's a problem, it still falls down. So for all of our viewers out there, look for Liz at a chapter or a student chapter near you sometime during the rest of the year we'll show, where she'll be pre- presenting, excuse me, on a wide variety of topics. 
We're also going to be doing a few of these virtually for the gen pop, as they say, the general population throughout the course of the year. So look for those as well. Liz, you made it through all the questions. I hope there was no <laughs> doubt in your mind that that, that was going to happen because I think they were easy. But, uh, we had another successful director's cut today. If you liked what you saw, and again, I hope you did, and again, you're watching at the end, so... If you didn't like it, why did you stick around? Click the subscribe <laughs> button. Click get notifications. We will let you know every single time we post a new video to the YouTube channel, which is frequently. Director's Cut is every Wednesday. We will have many more of these throughout 2021 and hopefully beyond. So, Liz, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. I think we had a good time. And we will see everybody next week.